So I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. David O'Dwyer. David is Associate Faculty in IOB and lecturing on one of the modules in the programme, and also to be joined by Michael Kavanagh, the CEO of ACOI. So I'll do a further introduction to both of the gentlemen later. Um, but for the moment, I'm just going to run through a little bit in relation to IOB and the programme, and then I'll pass over to David, and then we'll pass over to Michael. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. This event has been recorded. Um, and the recording will be available at the end um, or in the next day or so. Um, if you have any questions, you'll see on your browser, there's Q&A or chat. Please uh, type in your questions at any stage. And at the end, um, we'll review all of the questions and put it, either I'll answer or we put it to Michael or David. Um, and also any slides that are shown today will be available later. Okay, so, A little bit about IOB. So IOB, the Institute of Banking, we are a recognised college of UCD and we are the education provider to the financial services sector. Uh, we currently have 33,600 members working across all different areas of financial services, from banking to insurance to fund management, aircraft leasing, the whole spectrum of the financial services. Of those number of members, 8,300 studied with us last year. And I suppose what IOB is unique for is that we, I suppose, understand the issues that arise and are hugely supportive to all students who are working full time and also undertaking study. And the nature of the programmes that we provide um, are very much applied and are, I suppose, cover topics and information that help you remain skilled and to upscale and that are immediately transferable into your working lives. In addition, when people graduate, students graduate from the programmes, many members can continue on the lifelong learning journey by taking up designations offered by ourselves, IOB, and also by our, um, our partner, ACOI, the Association of Compliance Officers. And I'll touch on these later, and so will Michael Kavanagh. So what the um, designations do, I suppose, is they enable you to maintain your learning when you have completed your course. And it's, a, I suppose, a fantastic external validation to employers and to the marketplace that you are committed to your lifelong learning and keeping your learning up to date. So we're particularly today, we're going to look at the MSc in compliance. Compliance exists across all of financial services. As you'll all be aware, um, regulation across the financial services sector has grown hugely in the last number of years. And the role of the compliance officer has equally grown with that um, onset. Compliance leaders need to be, have a huge number of skills. They need a blend of technical, of management skills. They need to be able to influence people um, across their organization. They deal from the frontline people who are dealing with the customer right up to the board of directors and the regulators. So the role requires them to have a very broad knowledge and skills to be effective, both at senior management level across their organization and also then to be able to, I suppose, work at the cold face with their, um, their teams, uh, the front, first line of defense through the second line of defense and the whole way back up through the organization. The role, I suppose, encompasses a very broad range of topics, which you'll see when we look at the various modules that we cover across the MSc in compliance, but mainly the whole area of governance, the area of culture, the area of conduct across the organization is overseen by the compliance function. And it continues to grow and develop and evolve, I suppose, as a profession um, in, in recent years. And the MSc in compliance, I suppose, this program in particular, which was developed um, in consultation with the Institute of Banking IOB and the ACOI, um, has been taken, undertaken by the leaders in compliance and has proven to be a really effective program to assist them in their daily jobs. The program itself is a full master's program. Um, that means that it is uh, level nine. Uh, it comprises of 90 ECTS credits, um, and that's on the National Framework of Qualifications in Ireland and recognised um, outside of Ireland throughout Europe and the world. It's a unique programme in the fact that, number one, it is unique because it was developed by compliance practitioners for compliance practitioners with the academic rigour of being a UCD accredited programme. Um, and within it, there are two modules that stand as individual programs in their own right. So the professional certificate in data protection 
and the Professional Certificate in Financial Crime Prevention are two individual programmes um, within the MSc. So all those studying the MSc study these programmes, but these two modules can be taken independently. Um, if you, and then you can go on and complete the rest of the modules in the MSc. To undertake the programme, you must be a current member of the ACOI, and uh, Michael will tell us more about the ACOI uh, later on in the session today. Um, the programme will be delivered online. So this will be our nearly our third iteration of delivering the programme online, and it's proven to be really, really successful. Uh, the programme is delivered uh, mainly over weekends um, on Saturdays, and there could be some um, weekday evening lectures. Uh, it's delivered over two academic years, and you'll see why when I sh share with you the, uh, the modules that are covered. And the assessment in the program is a mixture of continuous assessment and final timed exams, but everything is done remotely. And within the, the delivery, I suppose, we, we'll talk a little bit more about that now, actually. Within the delivery, um, I suppose, what does it look like? So you have a virtual classroom, so it's, it's on a webinar like this. Um, and you have your, um, your uh, module coordinator, your member of faculty delivering. Uh, there'll be a variety of guest speakers and practitioners brought in throughout the programme, throughout each of the modules. And then throughout the day, you have breakout groups where you will you know, work together in smaller groups. And, and that's where the networking, I, I suppose, can still continue in an online environment. And while Obviously, it's less ideal than a face to face environment. It has proved to be uh, to work really, really well for this program because it's allowed, I suppose, people to maybe cut the commute time and particularly people have traveled from Kerry, from Donegal and from all over the country to do the program and being able to get that extra time and to spend it actually working on the subject has proved really, really well. You'll get access to a large repository of information through both the reading lists and the lecture slides that are shared with you. And as I said also, there's, um, there's plenty of guest lectures that come in throughout the period and specialists that come in and that add to the diversity of the delivery. So just to take a brief look at the, uh, the modules that you'll study, and the modules give you a really good flavor of sort of the content that you will look at um, over the period. So the first year, the trimester starts uh, September, 2021. And there are two modules, Ethics and Corporate Governance and Managing for Compliance. And then these are followed in February 2022 um, in trimester two by the other two modules that I discussed, the Financial and White Collar Crime Prevention and the Data Protection Policies and Procedures. And those four modules complete the first year of study. The second year of study starts in September 2022 and the International Financial Services Regulation Module, which is delivered by our speaker now today, Dr. David O'Dwyer, and Designing an Internal Governance Framework are delivered. And then the final modules in uh, trimester two of year two are research methods, followed by the applied project. And the applied project allows a student to pick any topic from any of the courses that they've covered from all of the different modules. And to, it, it can be a workplace project, where they can bring all of the skills together and it's like a mini thesis and it has proved to be really really effective um, for compliance officers who've learned a huge amount in being able to I suppose bring the academic and the, the practical things that they've learned to a live situation um, through the applied project uh, over a period of a number of weeks working with both their own company if, if they wish and with the, um, the academic lecturers involved um, and it brings huge confidence to actually apply your learning in a real life setting um, uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, what's been learned in the period. Whilst the trimesters are set up that you, we show them as two modules, you can take the course at your own pace and take the modules within the timing of the trimesters. So you can start with one module or the two modules, whichever suits you um, as you wish. So the cost of the modules, uh, the price has remained unchanged. It's 1,450 euro per module. And the final two modules differ slightly. I excuse the typo there. And uh, there is IFS skill net funding available for the modules, which substantially reduces the price. Um, and we can provide more information on that um, if you wish to look at that further. So now, uh, leading on then to ACOI. So 
the professional designation is offered by ACOI to successful graduates from the program. Um, and as I said, this enables uh, students, I suppose, to, to maintain their learning and to keep it current. Um, and Michael will talk to us a little bit more about that when he speaks. So I'm delighted, as I said again, to introduce our two speakers. So Dr. David O'Dwyer is Compliance Director at City, and he is Associate Faculty with IOB and has been delivering on this programme for the last number of years. And he is going to speak to us on the regulatory landscape and current issues facing compliance officers. David has been working in the compliance industry for over a decade. Um, he, before joining Citibank, he worked with other international financial services organisations and he holds a PhD in law. He holds a number of professional diplomas and certifications across a range of, of um, different disciplines. I'm delighted to welcome David to join us today. So I'm going to stop sharing now for a minute. And David, you might join me. There you go. So David, I'm going to hand over to you. And as I said to, to the uh, participants, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A or the chat. And when David's finished, we'll pick up on the questions, or sorry, we'll, we'll move on to Michael and then we'll come back and pick up on the questions. So David, over to you. Okay, um, thank you, Evelyn, and hello all. Hope everyone is, is, is keeping keeping well. Um, I suppose first off, thanks to, to, to IOB and, and ACY for perhaps uh, allowing me to, to come along to, to speak today. Um, so it's, I suppose I'm a massive fan of, of both organizations. I think they do incredible work uh, for all people, including myself, who are compliance practitioners. You know, I think there's been huge um, value and efforts over the last decades, and it's it's evident the, the quality of, of their educational offerings, um, which I'm very fortunate to, to be part of the lecturing team on the MSc, but I continue to sort of partake in a, in a range of their offerings um, on other modules. And again, being busy compliance professionals, it can be a challenge just keeping up to date with the ever-changing uh, regulatory, regulatory environment. Um, so I think as Evelyn uh, kindly introduced a bit of my background, um, the, the way I might just structure today in a sense, um, I'll give a little bit more, um, really probably just focusing on some of the insights that I've, that I've learned over my the last dec or decade or so that I've been working in the, in the compliance um, sector. I'll then jump into what I see are some of the current challenges and issues um, facing uh, compliance professionals. Um, in the current regulatory landscape and again as i always say it's very much dependent uh, to your own scenario and situation and your own organizational uh, model etc because it that, that that is important and then quite importantly when we what i might like to do is i might then focus on because again i'm very fortunate to be part of the, the lecturing team for the msc and we might take a look at um you know so how we tackle and discuss and, and triage some of those challenges as part of the msc module um, and some of the methodologies and tools that you know I have used and my teams have used and other organizations use to, to sort of tackle those challenges going going forward. Um, so to sort of to start, uh, as, as Evelyn mentioned, my, my background is in, in law. Um, eventually finished a, a PhD in law a number of fields, actually a number of several years ago at, at this point. But upon finishing, I was I was very fortunate at, at the time to, to get a to get a role with uh, it was KPMG at the time or we were looking for regulatory advisory uh, consultants to join their, their reg advisory team um, and I was very fortunate to, to one land, land a role uh, you know very impressive um, organization full of fantastic um, people and I suppose it, it was probably my first adventure if you will into the world of, of, of compliance and it was probably during that um, that sort of Couple of couple of years working was probably my first exposure to to working with with, with organizations in terms of the regulatory compliance challenges um, that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis a mixture of advise, advisory work predominantly in the areas of privacy aml governance and also then um, in just project work you know ultimately a lot of what we have to do on the compliance side you know does involve a lot of heavy lifting strategic thinking uh, and trying to deliver various outputs to the regulatory authorities um, and to in our internal audit partners, et cetera. So it was a it was a wonderful experience. And from that, I was again quite fortunate to, you know, life sometimes things happen. And I, I landed out on secondment in an organization called Elevon um, Financial Services. And for those who may not be familiar with Elevon, they are a sort of a licensed credit institution based out in, in, in Cherrywood. Um, but again, they're quite a substantial um, operation in the sense that they are licensed in Cherrywood, but have a number of branches and then operate on a sort of a freedom of services basis across pretty much all European 
um, member states. And what sort of jumped out at me there uh, from a compliance function perspective was probably a, a couple of takeaways. One, it was my first exposure experience to sort of working with a locally licensed credit institution who was wholly owned in a sense by a, by a large US parent, which is, it is a fantastic experience and a number of people who may be on this call maybe in, in that type of scenario where it, it throws up in one sense huge benefits um, often in terms of economies of scale in terms of the learnings that you can leverage from from uh, you know larger organizations but two it does create challenges you know it creates massive governance challenges locally to be able to ensure that those global processes and programs themselves work and are aligned to the, the expectations of the local regulators, whether, whether they be the CBI or whether they be a, a, another competent authority operating in, in, in another uh, European uh, jurisdiction. So again, quite an eye-opener, quite a fantastic opportunity to sort of work through some of those nuances and, and challenges. The second part actually that really jumped out during my time in, in Elevon, and particularly for compliance officers working in the international regulatory space was, we it was a sort of an unusual dynamic, which I may have, altered at, the, uh, at this point, but at the time uh, we had second line oversight for not just the European operations, but we had second line oversight for operations in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, um, and other um, non sort of European or, or operations. And again, it was probably the first time as a compliance professional um, beginning to work with, with colleagues in, in other, um, you know, other, other jurisdictions outside, outside of Europe, which again was quite an eye opener, quite a fantastic experience culturally uh, to begin to work with people. And what I again took away from that challenge was the, the sort of the unique um, sort of the commonality that exists between sort of compliance organizations, functions, regulatory expectations across various um, uh, ge geographical uh, uh, locations. So again, it was quite a rewarding experience. And the last piece that was quite fortunate for me again, um, was it, it was an unusual and it's probably I can't imagine I'm going to face this scenario again but when I joined um, Elevon it was quite a small um, operation from a risk and compliance perspective and over a six-year period it sort of expanded to over 100 people um, working um, under some fantastic leaders um, in, within within the risk and compliance function so it was one of those where myself I was afforded the opportunity to lead two particular programs one being the, the regulatory change um, program. So again, going back to that first point, it was sort of taking a large parent model for operating regulatory change and then working locally with our local partners uh, within the organization to try and embed in that particular um, process for the European operation. So that was quite a, um, a fantastic experience to, 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 to embed that process and also to build a team, you know, for anyone that works in compliance when opportunities come to, to actually build partnerships and teams is probably one of the most rewarding experiences one can have in the compliance space. And secondly, then for my sins, I, I was the data protection officer in, in Elevon, pre-GDPR, pre, um, and then had the wonderful experience of, of, of sort of being heavily involved in leading their GDPR implementation efforts, which I think is most people, anyone that was involved in GDPR, it was certainly a, a character building um, exercise for all, but again, it, it's certainly a wonderful um, experience. So after, um, and almost about, probably coming up now, about two and a half years ago, I joined City. Um, City Group, and anyone that's familiar with with City um, will know City is an absolute juggernaut of an organization. It's it's it, it's it's USB in a sense from a financial perspective is the fact that its geographical reach is just absolutely enormous. It is it has presence in in, in, in about ninety eight countries, uh, presence non presence but operating in sixty five other jurisdictions. So that geographical reach. Is massive and, and how city operates generally is it's it operates in sort of regions so i am part of the emea region um, it also has regions in nam apac and, uh, and latam and generally within emea how, how it, it tends to be structured um so i'm i head their regulatory management uh program which consists of three pillars one is their reg change program second is the reg inventory and third then is their regulatory mapping program which is again it's a sort of bau of mapping your assessment units to your controls and then working with your various assurance monitoring partners to, to ensure that, you know, ultimately the controls are doing what they what they should be doing. But ultimately, for my sense, I, I am responsible for the European um, cluster itself, um, so which, which itself consists of one of the lead vehicles is based here in Dublin. We've got Citibank Europe, which is a significant institution licensed by the SSM, um, has 22 uh, sort of branches across Europe, so quite a significant 
operation, we also now will have another significant operation and base out of Frankfurt in Germany, another large operation, CGME. So again, there's quite a lot of focus in City, and uh, some of it is you know, post-Brexit, uh, consolidating its position within that sort of European market. Um, and generally, we tend to be focused quite a lot on, just City itself generally has two big clusters, one is consumer-based, one is institutional clients. Most of the European operations are the, certainly the ICG, the institutional clients um, based. So the challenge I and my team have, um, I suppose, is running a pretty large rig management program across uh, one, the sort of European cluster, which again, as I said, is 22 um, franchises, 22 countries, and then operating quite closely uh, with my regional partners and my global partners, um, because again, as anyone will attest to, or will be familiar with if you, if you work in a large organization, there tends to be an appetite to try and drive things as consistently as, as possible. But then going back to that very first point I made, you, you're con continually mindful of ensuring local vehicle, legal vehicle governance um, and being able to stand over and present to the local regulatory authorities when, when needed and, and, and when called upon. Um, but I suppose stepping back then in terms of the, the overall um, reg landscape, and as I said, I'm absolutely fortunate to, to, to be part of the, the lecturing team for the DMSC and in the International Financial Services um, module. Um, and I suppose what the module is not, <laughs> it is not a line by line review of every piece of European um, financial regulation, because I suppose in a sense, we could be having a six year course on trying to go through the tens of thousands of pages of, of regulation that has been developed and is continuing to develop at a rate of knots um, at about a global and European and, and a local and local level. I suppose the way we, we tend to, to take a look um, at, at the module, I suppose in one sense, um, because again, and we're we'll touching this at the end, it, it is an MSE, it is a, it is a level nine um, qualification. So again, it is trying to develop, it isn't just telling people what the rules are, it's very much aimed at crit critically being able to look at and develop, um, understanding the thematic themes, insights, that are developing um, both sort of globally, regionally, but then also having the practical nuance. Because again, we are compliance officers at the end of the day, we need to drive solutions um, and behaviors within organizations about the tools and methodologies you can deploy um, that have worked in other organizations. And again, may have to be adapted to your organization, but again, there are only so many ways, and I genuinely believe this, you can, you can skin a cat, so depending on what the program is you're driving, um, you know, there, there are certainly good pillars that I think will be successful in most um, organizations. But the, the concepts that we tend to, to look at, one, we, we do tend to look back, um, and I don't want to spend too much time looking back, but it, it is important to sort of calibrate, um, because it's actually quite an eye-opener. If you, if you go back to 10 or 15 years ago, and you look at the sheer scale of change that has happened um, from a financial regulatory perspective over the last, obviously, post-crisis, the post-crisis agenda, um, which in itself is largely complete at this stage, but the, the level of change is essentially we've had a complete almost recast or, or revision or, or, or new rules published across the entire suite of you know, core 30 European uh, regulatory issuances. You know, and I say 30, generally your level ones or your, your core um, uh, regulatory pieces. We've also then had an entirely new supervis supervisory regime being sort of developed and cascaded across the, across Europe in terms of uh, the SSM um, and, and in terms of sort of the central bank and how the local authorities are now working uh, with, the, with the overall European authorities. So it's been quite a fundamental change and just to get an appreciation of that, 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 that how that regulatory architecture is, is, is evolving. It, it's certainly discussed and, and teased through at a global level. But what we do tend to look at then in a sense is, and it's quite important, you know, the, the advancement of, of regulation itself doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, you know, regulation happens to, to response, whether it's 08, whether it's what's happening over the last 18 months in terms of the coronavirus. You know, the, the whole aim of regulation is that it, it is generally serving a purpose. It's, it's generally driving towards some sort of a tangible output or tangible aim. And I suppose it's important to be able to critique um, and understand why certain things are happening at a policy at a policy level. So we do, we do look at that. Um, and then quite importantly, what we begin to look forward is we, we, we tend to look forward at what's coming. Um, and again, what's coming, I, I, there's what I would call the known knowns. There, there are things, and we certainly look at the sources that will allow us to cast our eyes forward. But, and it's important we can look at a global level. We can look at the global standard setting bodies who are increasingly being having a sort of pervasive influence uh, at about a regional level, a cluster level, and a local level. So, you, you know, FATF, the Basel, the Basel outputs, the convergence. Um, 
which is supporting um, and driving policy change at a, at a sort of a regional level. So we would certainly look at the trends, uh, the direction of travel, uh, that global standard setting body. We'd also look at the, there's quite a lot of criticism growing around the, the concept of the increasing prevalence, prevalence of sort of soft law and how these organizations are actually driving, maybe overly driving the bus um, within certain um, global um, geographical uh, regions. Again, an interesting, an interesting topic, but more regionally than and more tangibly, what we would tend to look at, and, and there are quite good sources, um, would generally be the action plans themselves that have been sort of endorsed and formalized at a European Commission level. And they're actually one of those, when you begin to step back and look at the range of action plans that are that are out there on the financial um, services basis. You know, we've got the you know the overall completion of the of sort of the banking union, you have the capital markets union itself, which had to be refreshed last year because due to sort of continued delays uh, about that overall program. We've got the overall consumer um, financial services action plan itself that is aimed at sort of enhancing digitalization fintech, which itself then is supplemented by a, an additional fintech action plan, which is aimed at sort of innovation and driving that that increasing use and open the market uh, in terms of new players into the overall financial services arena. And then most notably, and I think people will be quite aware, we, we, we had this sustainable finance um, action plan, obviously driven in, in, in 2018, which is probably one of the key um, topics. Um, in, I can't imagine there's anybody working in a compliance function at the moment that is not involved in some shape or form in a sustainable finance or ESG related project or initiative, whether you're providing credible challenge, whether you're working with your partners on how to figure out to get the data to support the upcoming returns that may be required if you are an in scope sort of financial market um, participant. And we'd also then maybe cast an eye, but again, I know there is this, again, from my own module's perspective, there is a dedicated AML module, but another action plan that popped out in recent weeks um, around the AML um, and then sort of CTF framework. Again, one of the key themes and drivers of all these action plans, in a sense, is trying to increasingly consolidate that, 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 that Euro market, not just, the, not, just, not just the rule sets, but also consolidate the, the level of convergence and supervisory architecture and approach in terms of how those rules are overseen and enforced by the relevant regulatory um, authorities. So, it's, it's quite a maze of, of, of requirements and it's one of the unique challenges and I suppose I would, I would see this when I operate in city and again I'm part of a global team in a sense but I'm the EU head but I would work with my, my partners in, in APAC and in North America and one of the real challenges we have in Europe is we, we do have that challenge where you've, you, you've got a sort of a layer of European law rules and regulations being published at a European level and ultimately depending on the type of legal instrument you know, at times we're having to wait for sort of national authorities to, to, to whether it be transposing it, whether it be adopting the guideline at a local level for supervisory purposes. So it's it's quite a nuanced and can be quite a challenging environment, particularly if you if you have a large scale presence um, and you're offering operating quite a large, diverse range of products and services across various markets. So it can be a challenge, but again, all challenges can can certainly be can certainly be solved. Um, and really then the, 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 the other areas we, we tend to, to look at, particularly from a module perspective, is where we're, we're looking at the various action plans that are crystallizing and developing and driving that policy. policy. We do tend to, if we are based in, in Ireland, I'm based in, in Ireland, Dublin is sort of a key financial centre and institution. We do look at then some of the hot topics locally that are certainly um, developing. And I suppose the, the, the number of hot topics that are certainly developing, some of which are will be cared for again by, by the European pieces is you're certainly looking at one um, you know, outsourcing for example is an absolutely red hot area which has been driving quite heavily from from Europe over the last couple of years we've had quite a number of CBI outputs we've also had the sort of outsourcing consultation paper published earlier this year with a sort of a, an eye towards the final rules being published towards the end of, of, of of, of, of this year. So again, it's quite a hot topic. Inter again, for anyone working in a large organization, the intra-scope, intra-group angle is certainly providing quite a layer of challenge and, and, and interest for, for organizations that are sort of set up in that sort of in that sort of dynamic. The other areas that are certainly jumping out, again, Central Bank has its op resilience uh, paper, which again uh, is, is a real hot area of, of, of focus for, for quite a number of organizations. And again, I suppose when you, when you are operating in, in a global organization, what's quite interesting is actually to see how the same type of policy papers are popped up already in the UK and Australia and Hong Kong. And it, it's sort of this global regulatory sort of convergence and will around certain regulatory topics. So it's, it's just interesting to see how resilience itself is, 
is sort of evolving. And then probably the, the last two, in a sense that we would, we would certainly pay um, attention to in, in over the course of the module, and we would certainly have a focus on, which we, we did last year, is, is probably culture and, and accountability. And I know this is ultimately obviously a red hot area that pops up across all um, a number of modules in terms of how you'd like to, to look at it. But particularly, I suppose everyone would certainly cast an eye towards the, the, the developments in recent weeks around the central bank's uh, general scheme uh, with respect to their individual accountability um, framework. And again, I know that that is a topic that is certainly going to be quite a heavy lift for a number of organizations. I think, I think a lot of organizations are already perhaps up and running and trying to get themselves mobilized. And, but again, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. But again, it's probably another example of, you know, Ireland is not unique here. You know, you look to the UK, you look to the, the Hong Kong, you look to the, the Australia, for example, this type of framework has already been embedded in, in a number of other um, jurisdictions. So there's certainly lessons that can certainly be learned for, for financial market participants that have perhaps faced this in another um, region already. And then and again, how they can sort of localize and, and, and use those learnings in, in, in the current Irish in, in the current Irish environment. So I suppose the question then, if I take a, a slight step back in a sense, so it's one of these at times I go to bed and I think how, <laughs> how can anyone sleep at night when you've got this much um, work ongoing in a in a sort of a regulatory perspective, which is, you know, it's constantly changing. The supervisory expectations are constantly evolving. I think what's, what's quite interesting is, you know, when you look at then the, what's happening across peer organizations, it's, it's like anything in life. At, at times, you, I think you see certain organizations that are perhaps raising the bar um, on, on certain areas, certain topics. And I think what tends to happen is the supervisors are going in, they're learning. But again, they're certainly learning because they're, they're often going in and it might be the first time kicking the tires on a particular uh, regulatory initiative or a particular regulatory area. And all of a sudden then that starts to create a sort of a snowball effect, um, depending on which organization and how they've been, how they've been um, looking and examining that particular topic. So really from a, a city perspective, how I, I am on my own team, very fortunate to, to work with some um, extremely talented people within city collectively um, and then also uh, we've been we've had a, a quite an aggressive recruitment campaign to be to building the sort of the right team that is needed to help support uh, deploying and maintaining a program of of this size because again it's it does require again when I'll touch on this in a moment there are certainly uh, technology solutions that can be leveraged and can be used for aspects of, of managing a, a sort of a busy regulatory management program, but you do need to be careful. You, you need to be careful with the where and how you deploy the technology to support you in, in the discharging of your, your, because ultimately you are responsible. And, and ultimately, you know, the, I always say to compliance officers, one of your big assets here is your technical knowledge. You need to make sure you won't become overly reliant on, on the outputs or the decisions that are being provided to you by some sort of an automated um, solution, you know, you and your team need to develop that, 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 that sort of knowledge. And again, the technical part for me in compliance is probably the easy part because again, it can be rigorous, it can be time consuming, it can take time to read and understand the rules that apply to the products and services within your organization. But ultimately it is just time, it's trying to find the time and trying to find the right people then to help support um, where we're needed. But what tends to happen um, within City then, and I'm gonna give a, just conscious of time, I'll, I'll give a, a brief example of, of in terms of how we we operate and, and quite importantly from a sort of a master's perspective this is, tends to be how we tend to work we tend to look theoretically uh, we look at very certain topics we try to focus on the, sort of the hot topics and then we look at tools and methodologies that I believe again there's no once there's no what we call one-stop shop there's no silver bullet here but there are methodologies I think that can be deployed and have been deployed across various um, organizations that people can certainly take away and we've uh, certainly got good feedback from from students um, over the last couple of years who have managed to take some of these learnings back into their other into their own organizations so um, two bits that we, we we tend to focus on in city one is one is scope um, and I always talk about any compliance program scope is important you know, trying to determine what's in in your program what's not in your program it sounds easier to, <laughs> certainly sounds easier than it um it, it, it is it can be sometimes quite a challenging um question the question really is you know how do you deploy a routine methodology um and without actually having a sort of a reasonably clear line of what's in and out of your program 
that you can lose an awful lot of time if you don't get those right. And secondly, you do need what I would call a methodology then for what I would call the gray areas. So the areas that people aren't quite sure, how do you decision three those reasonably quickly to sort of you know bring them into the program, keep them out of the program. And the question then is if something isn't in the program, it's not that you ignore it, it's just that you need to be comfortable someone's looking at it, but, but it may not be you and your team discharging your time on that particular on that particular topic. The second one, which is slightly related then, is, is generally trying to bed down your what I would call your roles, responsibilities, and, and process. And I suppose from my sins, I've, I've spent the last 10 years doing an enormous amount of that type of work where you're going into the organization, you're working often with a parent who is deploying a particular methodology, you're taking the methodology, and then you're working quite closely with your local stakeholders and partners to begin to try and ensure that methodology uh, works for that local organization. And insurance, particularly then from a local governance perspective, that you can certainly stand in front of the local regulator to be able to defend and articulate how your program is, is meeting local governance um, expectations, which, which in itself is, is certainly quite, um, quite a challenge. Um, and really then in terms of how we, we, we tend to operate, um, the program tends to be, and this is probably informed by my learnings from my previous organization, certainly informed by my current organization, one is, is what I would call getting your monitoring right, definitely coming back to scope. So from a city perspective, we, we are actively monitoring for about 90 regulatory issuing authorities across Europe. You know, because when you begin to distill down the types of rules and laws, rules and regulations that are in scope for your particular program, we generally operate on a franchise basis. So again, we've got 22 franchises across Europe. We then have defined identification leads operating within each franchise across Europe. So we do an incredible amount of training with our identification leads. So everybody is singing off the same hymn sheet, if you will. Um, and then we work with our identification leads and try and create structures that allow consistency in terms of interpretation and, 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 and overall, overall treatment. So one, really once you get that sort of monitoring piece, it, it, it starts to operate like like any process, you know, it's like clockwork, what's in, what's out, how do you triage the, the, the ultimate questions, which tends to lead you on to step two, which is more around how do you begin to decision, as I said, so the, the, the regulatory environment is, is operating at pace, so you, you've items publishing every day of the week, on average we would have, if I just take my EU hat for example, we would have 25 to 30 issuances publishing every, publishing every week, so in a sense the program that we've developed in a sense is that we, we would review the 30 issuances weekly and we would begin to disposition and uh, decision the treatment of each of those issuances um, as, they're, as they're published. Some of them are straightforward, we don't, we don't provide a product or service, other ones are more complicated. Other ones then in a sense, we actually know we're pretty okay. You know, we have a look, we're, we're stacking up pretty well against the, the current requirement. There's no additional action required. So it's about having a sort of a disciplined approach in terms of treatment again, and it's, my own experience, the expectation now, both internally and then externally, is that you're being, you're able to stand over in evidence. You know how you're making those particular decisions, who's involved, where's the evidence, um, etc. So an important concept. You then begin to get into the realm of what I would call impact assessment action plans, in a sense. So this is where you've been looking at the the new rules, regulations that are popping up across across your ballpark. Again, you may have just one jurisdiction, you may have twenty jurisdictions. But you're, you're trying to look at what's coming through. And I suppose the question becomes then, my own experience is you, you tend to have what I would say about 80% of items tend to be able to care for reasonably efficiently. You know, you don't need probably a formal project. You probably just need a process to maybe look at it. Maybe it, it requires adjustments to the training, um, process, procedures, no technology change. Every now and again, then you'll get, you'll get big changes um, that they're the ones I think you need to identify and anticipate reasonably early because they're the ones that require an enormous amount of time both as an organization strategically how do you ring fence those important items that you and the organization are devoting your time um, to those more important changes and, and, and opportunities and there's certainly def different ways you can do that and i've certainly learned lessons about perhaps paying too much homage to what i would i don't want to say they're not important but paying too much time on the, in the items which diverts time away from the more important ticket, uh, big ticket changes. And the last time then as you're sort of cascading it through this sort of overall um, demonstrable program is in a sense it's, it's reporting. So in one sense you're reporting on program performance, you know, are people 
you know, operating um, in a cadence that supports discharging responsibilities across the various countries. Secondly, then quite importantly, you're reporting to senior management and you may be reporting to the regulators. So again, this is where you need to be cautious of, and we, we certainly would tease out some of the nuances that exist uh, within the program about how you report MI to senior management. It's a, quite, a, quite an important concept. Nobody wants to see just metrics. People want to see insights nuances you know is this a genuine concern so trying to get that reporting right is certainly is certainly a challenge and then ultimately from my own program perspective what tends to happen then is there's quite a diligent process around what i would call the back end transition to BAU so you know maintaining your up-to-date uh, regulatory inventory um, and also then retaining your sort of what I would call your BAU program in terms of allowing the mapping of assessment units um, and controls depending on the, the overall risk of the of the regulation um, itself. So generally, again, it's hard to do it justice in a, in a, in a short presentation like this, but it's, it's quite a, a diligent methodology that, again, deployed reasonably successfully in my last organization, certainly deploying it here um, in city. It is resource intensive. It is, as I said, there are opportunities for technology to certainly support aspects of the program. The big challenge you have with technology, and again, it can be dependent on the size of your organization. If you're a smaller organization, Technology is probably fantastic. You're probably able to leverage and use that. Um, if you're part of a larger organization, the big challenge you have is that trying to integrate that te technical solution with the existing platforms within your organization. That generally is tends to be the headache for, for most um, organizations. But um, on that, that I, I suppose to, to sort of briefly wrap up what, why I would believe somebody would certainly benefit um, from doing the, the MSC and, and the level nine, I suppose one, it is a level nine you know, qualification, you know, regardless if you know, you're looking to improve your CV, it's an incredibly busy job market. Um, it is certainly going to look, um, and I know it does look quite impressive when you get CVs in the door, it shows one, it shows interest, two, it shows absolute you know, dedication of someone for a couple of years on the whole concept of compliance and best in class um, compliance. But probably the three areas that jump out to me, one is probably the technical piece, because again, what it's not is what I would say is a line by line, but it certainly allows people to strategically think about how the technical components of a pretty busy European regulatory environment tee together. And I think it helps solidify perhaps that, 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 that understanding. The second piece then is probably the design element. I think that's where this program probably separates itself from, from a number of other programs in the sense that you are coming out the other side of this is because it's quite a practitioner led um, exercise. You are coming out with tools and methodologies that you could hopefully bring back to your organization. Again, as I said, there's no standard approaches, but you can certainly bring back standard principles and begin to improve and evolve into your own um, organizations. And then quite thirdly, and it's quite an important piece, um, it's probably a softer skill component because again, ultimately what tends to happen, particularly in level nine, is there, there's quite a lot of discourse um, you know, you're, you're working with extremely talented people um, who will also be undertaking the, the MSC. Um, and it's one of the important points, particularly for modern day compliance officers, is that the days of just saying no, it, it's all about really building credibility. It's all about building the ability to persuade and influence people within your organization. So the idea of building those softer skills within a sort of a, a reasonably safe environment within the MSC, I think is quite, is quite helpful. And I know myself, it's I, I, one of the reasons why I, I love doing the, the course is the, the, the level of knowledge and, and back and forth from the, the student itself tends to be quite insightful. So um, so on that, I am just conscious of, of time and I, I know Michael has to speak as well. So I, I may pause there, Evelyn, if that's okay, and I can certainly answer any questions. That's fantastic, Davis. Thank you so much. So we've either completely scared everybody off because of the breath of it, or we've whetted people's appetites, which I hope we have. We've covered things from outsourcing to AML, to resilience, to sustainability, ESG, <clears throat> to culture, to SEER. David's covered domestic and the global environment and also personal development. So as you can see, there's a huge amount to be gained in, in doing this program. But now without any further ado, I would like to introduce our final speaker of the day, who's Michael Kavanagh, the CEO of ACOI. To most, many of you who I'm sure are joining us today, Michael needs no introduction, but that won't stop me giving him one. Um, so Michael, as I said, is the CEO of ACOI. Um, he also has uh, several other hats, which he does outside of his day job. Um, he is the board member of Carmichael. Um, he is also a member of the consultative group to the corporate reporting function for, e for ASMA, the European uh, Securities Markets um, Authority. 
He is vice chair of Sport Ireland and FAI governance oversight um, group, which I'm sure he gets to hopefully go and see many of the games and also a council member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Um, prior to joining ACOI, um, one thing I didn't realise was, well, I did, but I didn't realise that David was. So Michael was director of DPP with KPMG, which means that all three of us on this call have worked for KPMG in our, in our professional lives, me too. And um, he is, uh, sorry, and prior to that, he was um, the CEO of IASA, the Irish Auditing and Accounting Supervisory Authority. But with his CEO of ACOI hat, I'm delighted now to hand over to Michael. Thanks, Evelyn. And it's it's uh, great to have the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, I won't keep you that long. Uh, just very briefly, um, some of you are already members of ACOI and some of you hold our designations. Uh, but for those that don't, uh, as MSc students, you will become an affiliate of ACOI. Uh, and once you successfully complete the programme, you will be um, uh, invited to become a designate of, of ACOI. Uh, and indeed, with this programme, you will be invited for three designations, the financial crime compliance one, uh, data protection, and um, our highest uh, designation, which is the uh, fellow compliance officer of Ireland. Uh, so what does that mean? What can you expect from us? And what does member, uh, being a member of the association actually entail? Um, well, firstly, ACUI is the largest global association of compliance professionals. So it's a real Irish success story. We have over 3,250 members. Uh, we also offer the largest suite of compliance courses anywhere in the world. So in conjunction with our education partners, the primary one of which, of course, is the Institute of Banking, uh, we offer a whole suite of, of compliance related education offerings. Uh, and we're continuously um, adding to these. So Evelyn and indeed uh, David both spoke about the evolving role of the compliance professional. Um, I just wrote down technical management and influencing skills that Evelyn spoke about, and, and therefore we've now put on a certificate in leadership uh, to cater uh, for, for those evolving skills and needs, and we have a fintech offering as well. Um, just, I'm really going to touch on it very briefly, but we have three pillars uh, that's outlined in our three-year strategy. It's education, uh, promote and represent. So we've touched on the education one already, and, and you know, there's plenty of information on our website about the various educational offerings. Uh, but of course, it doesn't stop there. Once you do the MSc, um, you just don't stop learning. Uh, you have to keep up to date. Uh, and we mandate a for those with designations a CPD um, program, um, and that's very much aligned to what you've learned in and, and as part of the educational program and syllabus. Um, so, for example, of relevance. Uh, to this cohort and this uh, education course, you know, if you decide to take up the financial crime compliance designation, you will be expected to, to um, uh, sit through and, and conduct five hours of CPD in the year. The same with the data protection um, designation and the FCOI one uh, has 15 hours. Uh, of course, you can combine in five hours uh, data protection, five hours uh, financial crime compliance into that. Um, so we have a, an extensive CPD program. Last year, we had 50 CPD events offering 70 hours and almost 4,000 uh, attendees. Uh, and indeed, we've just come through quarter two, which had the highest number of CPD, CPD events that we ever ran um, with almost one a week. Uh, we've decided to, like the rest of the country, take August off uh, and take a break from it um, and we'll launch back into uh, Q3 um, in September. Um, I'll just combine very briefly the other two pillars, which is the promotion and representation ones. Um, so one of the goals that we had uh, is to be the voice of compliance and to be the go-to body, if you like, um, for media commentary on compliance. And in that context, COVID has been a very difficult time for everyone. Um, but purely from the ACY point of view, it's been quite extraordinary with the level of media attention that we've received. The word compliance has become a dominant one during this COVID era. And clearly that's a different type of compliance to what we're talking about when we're talking about the masters uh, in compliance. But nonetheless, it is uh, a prevalent word that's out there. And um, we took advantage of that in issuing a number of releases and surveys about back to work and what does the compliance professional feel about various matters. Uh, and they for certainly got traction um, uh, in, in the media, in the last 12 months, we've had over 120 articles 
radio interviews that I've participated in, mentions on Morning Ireland of various bits and pieces around that. So it has been quite a, a extraordinary. Um, and, you know, as I think off the top of my head, some of this has, has gone in areas that I wouldn't have thought um, of in the past. Uh, only in the last couple of weeks, I got a phone call from a, a journalist in the Irish Times who was going to write an article, or did write an article, uh, on um, bringing their car, not their car, everyone bringing their cars in for services. And of course now, we are all networked and Bluetoothed into these with our mobile phones. Um, and I recently changed car and now it reads out my um, text messages to me, which is a, a great development. Uh, but what it does mean is that that data is there. And there's been a problem and many problems in the UK where uh, the garage has accessed that information um, because it is stored uh, in, in the um, um, the uh, car's microchips. Uh, and this person was running an article on that and wanted us to comment on the GDPR aspect. So I gave a couple of comments, went back to our working group, uh, our data protection working group, and gave more commentary. And we really were extensively um, mentioned throughout that uh, three quarter page article. However, the downside of that was that poor Sinead, our member's executive um, uh, services person, was getting phone calls from people that were anxious about bringing their cars in for a service and what would they do? And they're, they're very concerned about this. So it tends to go in angles that you don't expect, but nonetheless, it's been very successful. Uh, as well as um, CPD, we keep our members up to date uh, on various um, mechanisms and forums. So we've our, our ICQ magazine, which I'm holding in front of me there, the summer edition, which outlines the latest developments uh, in the compliance area and, and is articles written by experts in their fields. We have a monthly newsletter. We have access to the working group sections of the website. Um, there are member only thought leadership publications and guides. So for example, of relevance uh, to yourselves is the data protection guide. And that, that would be a useful manual, if you like, for any MSc student. And that's been currently updated. And there are member only access uh, to presentations and speeches um, given by leading experts in their fields across the globe. Um, I just want to very, very briefly mention our podcast series. I would encourage you to listen to that series, which was launched, I think, in February. Uh, and that gives you access to Irish industry insights and key perspectives uh, of how the regulatory um, landscape is evolving and, and indeed how the compliance profession is driving change in this area. Um, I'm informed by students, particularly of the PDC, uh, that those podcasts are very useful as well in, in, in their studies and their journey through, through their education. Um, there's almost 600 minutes uh, available at the moment, and it's had over 6,000 downloads across 60 countries. So again, um, more successful than we certainly thought it would be. Uh, it seemed like one of these, a good idea at the time, but has, has taken off. Uh, and now we have people approaching us wanting to do podcasts with us uh, rather than the other way around, which is great. Um, again, just very, very quickly, I mentioned working groups. We have a series of working groups, which contains experts in their fields. Uh, so again, we have a financial crime compliance one, we have a data protection one, we have a consumer protection, uh, and we have a funds one, and um, uh, a couple of other ones as well. Um, and, you know, they are made up of people who are experts in their field. They're very useful to us and the executive. They write very good articles for the ICQ, and they input into the CPD program. And indeed, some working groups uh, hold their own CPD events, which is great. Um, Networking, of course, hugely important for the compliance professional. Now, I think this has evolved over the last couple of years, and, and David would have a view on it, um, but some of our older members still talk about the lonely compliance officer and the lonely compliance function and the kind of tick box approach that used to be in the past, which has very much evolved now. Uh, and now we have huge teams out there. But nonetheless, um, facilitating networking allowing members to exchange issues and problems and more importantly get solutions is very important to us. COVID has knocked a lot of that on the head but as we come out of COVID hopefully now uh, that will be back up and running again where we'll be back to a face-to-face -to -face annual conference for example. Um, our November one will be virtual but after that hopefully we will have more workshops, seminars, face-to-face uh, -face events, uh, annual dinners and regular networking events. Um, next year is also our 20th anniversary so there will be an awful lot of 
emphasis on uh, celebrating that and and socializing and, and and dealing with the social aspects around that and celebrating uh, what has been a very successful 20 years for ACOI. We'll also have a brand relaunch um, in the next couple of months. It is unlikely we'll be ACOI after that, but that still has to be uh, firmed up. Uh, and finally, um, I just want to finish off because it is important. Um, and David alluded to his role and his job and the multinational um, and across borders aspect of that. Uh, equally, from, from our perspective, um, we are founding members of IFCA, the International Federation of Compliance Association, and that has evolved rapidly in the last couple of years. Last year was its first, I said it's, it's our, we're, we're, we're very much members of it, um, uh, Congress which went on for five days. Uh, this year's one is on in October, where we will have 10 speakers, uh, more than any other association, uh, and that will be going on for five days as well. Uh, and we've recently joined, and indeed initiated in many cases, uh, a European network, which interestingly is made up of compliance associations, which are not members of IFCA yet. Um, and that, of course, is to look at the European side of things and to influence and uh, have our say, if you like, as compliance associations in the future directives that are coming down the track across the board. So that's that's an interesting aspect as well, uh, and a relatively new one. Um, so that's all I want to say. Um, I'm very happy to take questions, and uh, I won't take up any more of your lunchtime. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Thanks, Michael. That was really informative as well. Um, we've had a good few questions in. I've tried to answer many of them as we have um, gone on. I've just one here. Um, I'm going to send it over to you, David, if you're happy to take it. Um, it's from Joanne. And the question is, do you rely on your staff for keeping abreast of all upstream regulatory changes on an international level, or do you monitor it all yourself? So I hope it's not the latter, David, but I'll let you answer that. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic question. Um, so you're going to take my ballpark, about 23 franchises. So my team, we cover three, in a sense. We, we cover the European, what I would call issuances. So anything in the European Journal, the European Supervisory Authorities. So we, we cover that centrally. Um, we also cover the Ireland franchise, so anything locally by the Central Bank, etc. And we, I also have a team in Frankfurt. So we, we cover the Frankfurt German branch. But in all of the other branches, it, it's a case of coordination. So I would work quite closely with my local compliance lead and contact who themselves then would have a list of defined regulatory authorities that they are, they are monitoring. And then quite a lot of coordination between the groups then to keep everyone on the same, on the same page. Thanks, David. Now I'm just answering another one here as we go. So listen, guys, we are running very close to time and, and just being respectful of everybody's lunch times. I just want to say a huge thanks to both David and to Michael for their contributions today. Um, we, uh, Adam and myself, are available at any stage if you have any questions. The uh, programme brochure is on our website, iob.ie, under programmes, and you can get further information there. And I'm sure um, if you have any questions you want to pass on to David or Michael, send them through to us and we'll uh, send them on. Um, so thanks, everybody, for your time today and uh, looking forward to seeing some of you on the programme.